Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 1 series. Jesus Presents Desire for Personal Change. Filmed on the 12th of July 2014 in Monkeray, New South Wales, Australia. So we're 10 minutes late before we begin. That's a good sign. We've got a lot of information to gather with you today and it's a good sign we're 10 minutes late before we start. Okay. So everyone a bit warmer now? Yes. How many of you were challenged by the cold breakfast? No? Honest? Be honest, you know? Be honest, yeah. Particularly when it's cold, you sort of want something warm generally, hey? How many of you uh, did drink your two litres this morning? Very good. So is that new for you, for many of you? No? Some of you, yeah? How did you feel with it? Not bad? Joy? Free microphone, whoever's the runner. Thank you. Um, I just had to pace myself. I had to keep on target. Yeah. And the only thing that's hard about it is when the water's cold because the room's so cold overnight. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, it's all right. Yeah. I just had to keep going. So how many of you did it just because I suggested it? Yes. Be honest. Okay. And that you thought you might get in trouble today if you didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, is doing something for somebody else worth doing? If it's like that, if it's a fear based thing? Not really, is it? No. Well, today we're going to talk about this topic. As you can see on the board there, it's a desire for personal change. How strong do you think your desire for personal change is? Any comments about that? <laughs> That's fire away, Christiana. I think there's a difference to what I would feel would be true yep. as opposed to what I'm deceiving myself to be true. Okay. Yep. Yep. So you're starting to realise that, that what you think is true is possibly not true. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, so what, the reason why Mary, myself and Corny are here is because we want to help you make some basic shifts in some basic ways. And if we can just go through those ways with you. The first way is we want to help you grow in your desire to receive God's love. So that's one major way that we'd like you to grow. Many of you don't grow in your desire or have not grown in your desire to receive God's love. All right? Are we all right? Okay. So another way is we want you to grow in your desire to actually love God. See, a lot of times we're so narcissistic <laughs> that we don't think that maybe God might like our love. We, we just want love from God, but we don't often think that God might want our love. And so fr frequently we don't actually have a relationship because a relationship is a two-way thing, is it not? Yep. So a relationship is one, two, one, two people involved in something, a relationship. So we, we would like to help you grow in your relationship with God as, as your primary focus. Now, how do you feel, many of you, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that is your primary focus? No, not really. What, what's been the primary thing that's attracted you to divine truth then, if that's not your primary focus? If we go across to there, thank you. Yeah, um, well, for me, I thought for a long time that it was. Yep. And possibly intellectually it still is. Yep. But my soul is just not there just so rebellious and so resistant. Okay. And let's get away, if we can, from saying intellectually it's like this but emotionally it's like that. 
because to be frank with you, anything intellectually where it's one thing and emotionally the other thing, it means the intellectual thing isn't real, it's just a great big facade anyway. So let's just stop that straight away, shall we? Can we just say how we really feel? So I don't, uh, whenever you say intellectually it's this, emotionally it's that, you're trying to justify why you, you're at least doing something. You've got it intellectually. Does that make sense? And we need to get away from that if we're ever going to make any real progress. We need to see things as they really are. That's the reality. Okay. So do you want to grow into becoming a more loving individual? Now let's get really honest about this. Do we really want to grow and become a more loving individual? Well, how do you define love? Do you find, define love as you getting everything you want, you, getting every, you doing everything you want, everybody else f fitting into your life, you get all your addictions met? If that's how you define love, then you're not growing in love. You're growing in bartering, addiction, and a lot of other things. So let's... Do you really want to grow in love? Is the real question. Now, I suggest that what I observe in many of you is that you haven't grown in love, so therefore you don't want to. Right? And we've got to work out what, why you don't want to. And that's something we'll be trying to help you with over the next few days. Okay. How do you know whether you really want something? I'll just leave you with that question because we're going to discuss that more today. So what we want to do, Mary, myself and Corny, is we want to highlight to you your stagnation and, and your resistance to growth. We want to help you get beyond the point you currently are and into a point where you're really sincere about your relationship with God, that you're really sincere with your relationship with wanting to grow in love and you're really sincere about all of these things to do with God's truth, that, that there is actually a demonstrable sincerity inside of your actions. That's where we'd like to help you go. So, what are we going to need to learn to develop before we change? Di? A sincere desire to... Um want to change yes you do you were going to need a sincere desire to want to change certainly and mary's going to this afternoon talk to you about that what else are you going to need Should we go to barbara humility you're going to need humility let's define humility what is it um a passionate desire to feel all of my emotions as they arrive, as they occur yep we're going to have to get rid of this sound this Okay. okay, so the question was, what do I need to do to get a desire for personal change? And the comment was, we need humility. But the question then becomes, what is humility? What is humility? A... Let's... Hands and mics. Thanks. It's a, a passionate desire to... Um feel uh, all my ex to feel all my experience really feel all of your emotions yeah whether they are painful or pleasurable yes so it's very important isn't it regardless of, of how others feel, or yeah. I even feel about them actually yeah. yeah so how many of you feel you're really really humble to all of your pleasurable emotions See, it's, it, isn't that interesting even most of us are not even that and then how many of us feel that you're really really humble to your all your painful emotions so that's Let's talk about the humility factor for a second, will we? Okay, so how many people are sensitive to all of their emotions all of the time in this audience at the moment? Can we say zero out of, what, how many are there? 70, round about 70. So how many percent's that? Ah, okay, that's pretty easy to work out, isn't it? Zero percent, okay. How many of you feel that you are some of the time sensitive to some of your emotions? Okay. So how many is that? If it's pretty much it's pretty much most of you, isn't it? That you think you some of the time. How many of you aren't in that list? Right, just a couple. Right. 
Interesting. Who puts up their hand? Okay, so let's say 69 out of 70. Say this is how they measure themselves. So what's that in a percentage? It's about 98, 99%, isn't it? So 98% is pretty easy to work out. Say that. They say that, yeah. You know what I feel the measurement of that one was? I feel that there's four people in this room who will do that. And you said there were 69 people in the room doing that. How many of you feel your facade emotions at least some of the time? Now, this, this is one thing I feel almost everybody can put up their hands for, right? The facade emotions, we're all really comfortable with, and many of you are thinking that your facade emotions are going to actually help you grow, and they won't, actually. And we'll talk about that when we talk about your facade tomorrow. But many of you, you when you look at the facade emotions, it's actually like this many of the times, right? 100% of the people are actually feeling... A mo a lot of the time, but they're actually feeling their facade emotions. They're not actually feeling their real emotions. Right? So this is a problem. This is an indicator of humility. My feelings are there are four or five people in the room who are actually humble to some of their emotions some of the time. Is that, that's a pretty hard, hard truth, is it? Considering that some of you felt, thought that you were pretty connected and pretty much focusing on it and so forth? Yeah. By the way, we're, not ex we're excluding our presenters in all of this stuff, in all, in all of this. Oh, I'm just saying this is how it is. So if humility is a measure of change, our desire to change, how many of us really desire change there? Not too many of us, right? Not too many. Okay. So what else can we talk about with regard to the desire to change? What other things do you feel are important with this desire to change? Like how, how do I develop the desire to change? If we come down to... Um, a willingness to see the truth as God sees the truth of, yep. about me. Very good. So, you know, we can, we can power up the same things now, can't we? We can go humility, um, humility, truth, desire for truth, and a desire to love, right? These things, these three things are our primary things, are they not? Like, we've already, I'm saying to you, this humility issue is an issue because we've got the majority of us are not even feeling our emotions yet. We're not really feeling our true experience. We're just feeling a facade experience. So, so we've got a problem with humility. Now, if we've got a problem with humility, we're not open the truth. So the truth can just bounce off you under those circumstances. Can you see that? It's just going to bounce off you. And if we've got a problem with truth, we're never going to really know love because our definition of love is going to be completely different to, everyone else, to, the, to the God's definition of love. So our definition of love will match the world's definition of love, which is not love. It's a bartering system. It's a codependent bartering system. So the majority of us are in codependent bartering systems with our partner, with our friends, with people on the internet, with people in the world, and we call that, oh, I'm a very loving person. And God doesn't have any of those kind of relationships right, at all and won't have a relationship with you like that either. So this is part of our problem. Now, what's the next part of our problem? There's some things we're not realising. One of the things we're not realising is that for, our, for ourselves to grow, we are the persons who are completely responsible for our growth. We are the persons who need to be self-responsible. No one else can do your growth for you. And your growth is going to be completely dependent upon what you choose to do. No one else can force you. No one can make you change. No one can help you connect emotionally. No one can make you humble. No one can make you open the truth. No one can make you love more or even want to love more. No one can change your will aside from you. 
You know, God won't even do it. So you can ask God, please change, help me change my will. God's not going to help you change your will. He'll do things to help you come to see what you need to do to change. God will always do that. But God's not going to make it happen for you. You're going to have to make it happen. So if you want to, if you want to develop a desire for personal change, it all really depends upon me. me, doesn't it? My desire for personal change depends upon me. My personal change depends upon me. No one else can be responsible for it. So it depends on you, it depends on me. Let's, let's make it personal. It depends on me. I am responsible. We have a big problem with taking personal responsibility. And if we have a big problem with that, we're probably not going to change very much. And the only changes we're going to engage is when we don't have to take responsibility. <laughs> so we, we need to change that. Okay, so, so many of us at this stage, and this is something we want to open with, with you to, uh, today and, and, and for the entire assistance group, is that your past few years of your life, since you've come in contact with Divine Truth, you've thought that you've been changing, many of you, and some of you have changed a little bit. But the soul-based changes that are necessary for you to continue developing in love and to grow towards God haven't been happening. And there's a reason why. And the biggest reason why is because inside of you there has been yet to be any personal responsibility for that change. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It is up to you as to how this relationship will go with God. And it's up to you how much you will change from an emotional perspective with regard to love. Now, one of the first things we need to do is become honest with ourselves. That's what we need to do. So can I suggest we're going to become honest with ourselves in three areas. Any, any idea what those three areas are? What, what would, how would you measure your desire if you think about it? What would you do, if you, were, if you were honest with yourself, what would you do to measure your own desire for something to actually occur? What would you do? Any ideas about that? Yeah, good, some good ideas. Let's go down to Kate, then across to Eloisa, and then um, we'll, see, we'll see how we go after that. The reality of how much change is actually occurring in our life. Very good. So you would... You would make a, shall we call it a personal assessment. So, so you'd be willing to have a personal, personal assessment. Of the change, of the actual change. You, you would measure it. So when you compare your life, say, with five years ago, many of you would, would admit to yourselves that your life has changed from an external perspective. In other words, you've changed your job or you've changed your house or you've changed your partner <laughs> or you've changed you know, lots of different things right, in your life. But how many of you can say truly that you have changed in those five years? That you are a different person now, like the things that made you angry five years ago don't make you angry anymore. And, the thing, and it's automatic, it's not something you've forced. And the, and the way you act with people five years ago is completely different with the way that you act now. There are very few people in this auditorium who can actually say that. Because, and, and that's an indication that the soul is yet to change. So you can change your physical location. And, and by the way, when many people get to the spirit world, this is what they do. They go to the spirit world, they in a location, and they go say, oh, I don't like my location, I'm just going to go to a different location. So they try a different location, but it's all flat. 
It's all where their development is. It can't go any higher because there's no change in their soul. And it's not until you change your soul that you hit this barrier, that you go beyond the barrier of your soul's limitations. Right? So many of us haven't gone beyond the barrier of our soul's limitations. We've just gone beyond our comfort zones from a lateral perspective. We've just changed our job, changed our situation, changed our partner, changed our friends. Changed. But, but internally, emotionally, there's been no real change. Right? So we've got to be honest with this assessment. Saying that you've changed when really all that's happened is your personal circumstances externally have changed in that you've changed jobs, changed homes, changed location of living and all those kind of things is not really an indication of change. Right? Not the change anyway that we're talking about. What's really an indication of change is whether you feel differently than you did then. Now, I feel that many of you could say you have you do feel differently than you felt when you first heard divine truth. Would that not be the case? Many of you do feel differently. But what about these really core feelings, the really stubborn things, you know, the addictive relationships that you have? Most of those remain the same. So this is the issue where this is what creates stagnation. Okay, so we need to personally assess change. What else can we do? to see how we're going with how do we personally assess our change is the question what what we, we say you have to measure the past and compare it with the present that's one of the things that kate just suggested what other things are there than, than other than that louise next just behind um, other people's assessment of you yeah i don't know about that my my feelings are that the most of the time other people's assessment uh, 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 is totally unreliable. Um, you know, there's times when I know I've made progress and people think I'm getting worse. So, so for example, when I make progress, I no longer feed another person's addictions. So in other words, I have less feeding of their addictions. Most people around me think that means I'm getting more angry. <laughs> and all I'm doing is just drawing a line and saying, say, no more addictions. That's actually more loving but people around me think it's not loving. So I don't know if you can always assess it through, you know, looking at other people's reflections. Of course, if those people are honest and have your welfare at heart, then you may be more able to see it through their reflections. In other words, it might be something you might consider then. In other words, if they have demonstrated love to you in the past, and they're saying to you, I think you've changed in this direction, and I have, think you haven't changed in that direction, then, then maybe it's worth listening to them then, if they've demonstrated love to you. But if they're only doing it to attack you and denigrate you and pull you down and make you feel bad about yourself, then I'd suggest you could pretty much ignore everything they say. That make sense? Yeah. So it depends on whether they have a feeling of love for you when they talk about your condition or not, as to whether you could actually include it in the assessment. But I feel there's more personal things you can do in your assessment. Yeah. Rachel, if we go back. Um, the amount of love, uh, God's love we feel connected to flowing and flowing through us and that we can, the amount of love we can give. Okay. Now that's pretty hard, isn't it? Like how many, if we were really honest with us, how many of us could say that we've even felt the flow of God's love in any regular basis? So that's pretty hard. Um, we want to get to the stage where we do feel it, of course, but, but in this interim stage where we're just working through all the reasons why we don't feel it, we're probably not going to feel the flow of love in that pace. So it's going to be pretty hard. Now, I suggest to you, many of you who have been trying to use God's love as a flow-based assessment of your, own, of your own progress, with there being no other progress in your life, my suggestion is you've just been in a codependent addiction with a spirit who, who you are happy to believe is God, giving you energy, giving you feelings, giving you all the things that you feel were good, but it's not God because no other changes have been demonstrable in your life. Right? So, so there's obviously not God involved in that process. So I feel that's even difficult initially. There's, there's, there's easier ways, I feel, to assess how things are going. Yeah? So... 
we go down to Mel here, and then across, um, yep, up, up the back to Mel. Yep. Um, you would, not that I'm great at it, but when, or even good at it. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be good at yeah, it. Yeah. Act, action it, you, you do your personal assessment, and then you have a desire to want to look at that more honestly and make changes by actioning it and for me it's looking at fear more sincerely and so so how do we measure our actions that's well, you, you just do it you, um yeah so what i'm trying to do is simplify for you a way or a method that you personally can use mm -hmm. to measure to see whether you actually have a desire for personal change does that make sense? That's yeah. what I'm trying to achieve here in this in this talk, trying to help you through that process. So what I'm I feel that yes, that's true, but but a lot of times we don't feel like acting, isn't that true? Yeah. Like you you a lot of times you're scared stiff of acting, right? And, and so the feeling is still within you. Yeah. That I don't really want to act, but I know I should. Yeah. And and to me that's not my will changing, that's my what I would call willpower changing, and Mary will talk to you about those yeah. different the differences between those two things. Right? So there's a difference between my will, my soul-based emotional will changing, and the, my willpower changing. Yeah. Right? Many of us have changed our willpower. I agree, but that's a that's a real force of effort. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. Once your will actually changes, you, you want to do what's right. You want to do what's good. You want to do, be more loving. You want to be more truthful. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. So, so what do I do? What do I do to measure whether that's actually happened or not? Eloisa? Shall I say something? Uh, where are Sorry. We? Uh, no, you can't. Sorry. <laughs> I reckon that you would um, be able to measure it for me if I, because I know many things I'm terrified of, and if I went back into that situation and I do not act the same automatically, like the more honest I get with myself, the more I'm like, yeah, I want to avoid that situation. Whereas there are times when I'm a little bit softer and I'm like, no, no, like I actually don't want to avoid that. Like I can kind of see why I want to. So could you say it's a difference in the way in which you're using your will. On one side, you feel, you feel like you're forcing yourself to do something. Yes. And on the other side, you feel like, oh, it's automatic now. Like, I feel like doing this and, automatically. And you want to. It doesn't mean that I'm not afraid of it. It doesn't mean that I've... But you, but you, you yeah. want to. And, yeah, and want you to. feel drawn towards doing it. Yes. Okay. So, so let's put up there, and I'll put this as number two, right? The use of my will... And can I put in there brackets automatic? All right. In other words, what's my automatic response? Yeah. I'm just thinking about like I used to be terrified about going to the supermarket. Okay. And so your like, automatic response was like avoid, I do avoid, not want avoid. to go. Pete, can you go? Yeah. You know, and obviously never could. And he and he wouldn't go because he's working, whatever, yeah, doing totally. stuff at home. So. And so. now I love going to the supermarket. Okay. And the kids different. help, and it's like it's fun. And before, when you went with the kids, what was it like? Hell, like the woman who no one wants to know. Like so when you say screaming, hell, let's describe it. Pulling it? stuff off shelves, running, yelling up and down the supermarket, in a, weeing on the floor sometimes. Um, I'd hide behind things to have a cry. Yep. They would be like whizzing around with their trolleys, crashing into people's legs, especially the old ladies who are afraid that they were going to. Yep. Then I'd be apologising and trying to like sweep up after them. Yep. They'd be pulling stuff out. So it's basically those. a nightmare. To yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so then, and, and, and no wonder you didn't want to go. Yeah. So something's changed and now you want to go. Yeah. So what's it like now? Now we go in, the kids get their trolleys or they sit in it, they choose, they whiz around, go and get everything that they want, and then we have to do a bit of a uh, addictive a sort food out. sort out yeah. before we go <laughs> okay. and say, I'm not paying for that. Yeah. And then they, they whiz around and get me things and bring it to the trolley, ask me where they can go, and we're out of the supermarket in half an hour. Right. So something's changed, obviously. Yeah. So, and, and you now have a desire to go. 
Yeah, That's I love going because it's right. tasty food. So the use of the will automatically has changed. You, there's a feeling now inside of you that I want to go ahead and do that now. And also the law of attraction is very afraid of who I was going to meet in the supermarket. Yep. And now I'm really like excited, excited about who's there, like who am I going to see this week? And yep. sometimes it's just mum, sometimes it's just men. Yep. It's amazing, the supermarket. Yep. Just spend more time there. So this is an indication too, right? Some change is occurring. And by the way, Eloisa is one of the persons that I know has the in, that I included in the four. Right? And, and you did not include yourself in the four. <laughs> you didn't include yourself in the 69. <laughs> right? Which is an indication that you're still not an uh, accurate assessment of yourself. Yep. Okay. So use of my automatic will has changed. What's another way I can measure? Let's think, think about it. Um, how much time I'm using in the desire that I have. Uh... Yeah, this is number one for me. How I use my time. How I use my time. Yep. This tells me a lot about me. How I use my time tells me a lot about my real desires, my real passions, my real wants, my real addictions, everything. It tells me lots about everything, how I use my time. Now, I'm going to spend a bit more time on each of these in a minute, but let, let, let's, let's come up with a third way of measuring and assessing whether I do really have a desire for personal change. What's, what do you think the third way that I want to discuss with you might be, Matt? Um, what I'm attracting into my life. Yes, the law of attraction. But mm. you see, many of you are very, very uh, dishonest with yourselves about your attractions. Uh, for example, okay. I've, I've seen many of the guys attract a woman serving them and going, this is real cool. This is real good. I must have done something in my soul because women serve me. And I'm going, what do you mean? Why do you want other people to serve you for? If you're a self-responsible being, you don't need anybody to serve you. It's not a loving thing to want other people to serve you. <laughs> so we can fool ourselves with so-called attractions. See, that to me, if a, if a man constantly has women serving him all the time, it means that there's an emotion coming out of him that he's got lots of demands, lots of demands that women look after him. And most of the women know, oh, if I look after him, I'll get something in return. Maybe I'll get some approval, some acceptance. He's in codependent addiction with women, in my mind. But in his own mind, he, he thinks, oh, my law of attraction has been pretty good. Uh, it's, it's like the man who has a string of women you know, sexually, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and he says, oh, my law of attraction is pretty good. Oh, I don't think it's pretty good. I think he's pretty immoral. <laughs> From God's perspective, he has no ethics. He's breaking his soulmate relationship all the time. <laughs> so he's got no ethics. So, you know, to me, we've got to be very careful with our own assessment of the law of attraction because most of the time we try to view it in our favour, do we not? You go, oh, yeah, that thing happened. That must mean, and what, what do we follow that up with? That must mean, oh, I've done something, you know, great, you know. <laughs> you know my, I'd put to you, if you don't know what you've done, you probably haven't done something great at all. A self-aware, responsible being knows what they've done in harmony with love and truth. They don't guess. They don't have to guess. Right? So I'd be very careful. While it is a way, it is a feedback system that God has given us, the majority of us do not accurately assess it. The majority of us assess it in a way that's very, very, what I would call unethical and quite often immoral. We, we see things like, you know, I've heard people say, oh, I've attracted a person. For example, let's say I attract Fab and Fab's nice and kind to me. Oh, that was me. I'm so good. You know, it's got nothing to do with Fab's will that he wanted to be kind to me. I'm thinking it's got nothing to do with the fact that Fab wanted to give me a gift. <laughs> right? I'm thinking, oh, it's all my law of attraction. No, <laughs> it's a man wanted to give you a gift. It's a beautiful thing what he did. But it doesn't mean that you attracted it just because he decided to do it. He used his will to do it. And he might be just a very, very kind man who's willing to do that with everybody, no matter what their condition. So this is where we've got to be very, very careful. The majority of when we come to assessing the law of attraction, 
we have a lot of trouble with it. We're not truthful regarding the assessment. So what are some things we can be truthful regarding the assessment of? Thanks, sir. Looking at the choices that we make, like to avoid stuff and or not avoid stuff. Good. So now let's develop this idea of choices. What kind of choices can we make? There's really two kinds of choices we can make, isn't there not? So choice. What, what kind of choices we can make? Loving or unloving. Yes, but how do I assess what's loving and what's unloving when I already have a distorted viewpoint of what's loving? Um, what creates... So, see, see, can I expand that further? I could say, Luli, you think what's loving is when a man looks after you, right? You think that's so nice. He's so loving. And you're in codependent addiction with him and that's not love at all. So how do you assess the difference? Over the long run, about whether it becomes painful or pleasurable. So in other words, you've got to measure it over a year or two, work out whether it's become painful or pleasurable, and then go, oh, there I went, the last whole year was a blow-off, was it? Okay, all right. Then you can be a bit more self-reflective about looking at what you're getting out of it and whether it feels icky. Yeah, but the reality is people in addiction don't think something's icky when, it, from God's perspective, it is. This is my trouble. I, like, I'm, like, if I'm coming from a place where I'm distorted in love, right, I'm going to think, think that things are loving when they're not, and I'm going to think that things are not loving when they are. Like, for, to give you an example, we, myself and Mary, we, we created this, uh, you know, the Australian Assistance Group email that you all dealt with to go with Paige and Kerry to, to do all of your bookings, right? And we monitored the emails flowing back and forward because we wanted to deal with issues of love as they arose, right? And what we observed, and we instructed Paige and Kerry very carefully. We actually said to them, we want you to be direct and specific about any problem that the person has done with regard to the way in which they booked their booking, and particularly with the way in which they paid their funds and so forth, right? Now, when Paige and Kerry followed our instructions, many of you started to get angry with Paige and Kerry and feel that Paige and Kerry were angry with you. Paige and Kerry weren't angry with you. They were just telling you the truth that you didn't put in the last $70 that you needed to put in or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. That's all they were doing. And yet many of you believed that they were getting angry with you. There's a distortion of love, right? You, you think you, What you think is that somebody's got to handhold you through a process and take a lot of responsibility away from you through the process and you believe that's love. And this is what we do with our own children. We do the same with our own children. We handhold them through the process. We hand, and we do the same because we believe it's all love. It's not love. It's just addiction. We're creating addiction over and over again. And when a person tries to break that addiction in us, we go, you're being unloving to me now. You're not being kind. You're not being helpful. And all they try to do is just show you where the addiction is. See, see those, this is one reason why we don't hear much or feel much from God. God's always trying to show us where our addictions are and we're always going, oh, but I want more. I, I want to be handheld. I want to be reassured. I want all my fears to go away while it's all happening. And God's saying, no, no, these fears are all inside of you. There's nothing I can do about them until you let them go. And we go, no, no, no. I want you to help me go through the process so it doesn't feel challenging and it, doesn't, and it feels nice and comfortable while I'm doing it. And so, of course, we get into addictions with spirits and other people who are willing to feed all of that rather than have a relationship with God. Right? So our assessment of what's loving and unloving is completely, completely you know, off kilter. So how do we go about assessing ourselves when our... The whole idea of love is all distorted. Thanks. Okay. Remember, it's about choice. I was just thinking, um, because our anger is a sign that we're resistant emotionally to going deeper, that we could look at like how frequently we're choosing anger versus 
the alternative? Yes, I'd probably put that into what's the use of my automatic will. So if I'm sure. automatically getting angry in certain circumstances, that's, there's a measure in that area. We'll talk about that area more. There's one other area. If you just think, um, there are some things that are just absolute, and then there are some things that are really what I would call personal opinion, personal assessment. Often, everyone has a different opinion. Now, what are the things that are absolute? You tell me what they are. You know what they are, so you can tell me. What's absolute? Nina, in front. God's laws. Okay, so God's laws. What are all God's laws based around? Love and truth. Love and truth. Right, okay. Now, we've just said that we have no idea about love, have we not? So let's cross that out as a method of assessment because we're no good at it, right? So what are we left with? Truth. truth. We've got left with how we go with truth as an assessment. Okay. So, so can I put in as number three how I go living in truth? Because this is like a black and white thing, isn't it? You know, I either do it or I don't do it. <laughs> so it's a way, anything that's black and white like that is great because I can measure it. I, I can assess using things that are black and white. This is fantastic. So, so shall we now go through, and maybe to help us, Fab, you'll have to skip a few slides. Yep, keep going until you get down to how you use your time. Because that's what I'd like to focus on first, this use of my time. So let's go there. Now, if I'm really honest with myself, in my use of my time, just keep going, yeah. Keep going. Yep, keep going. Keep going. Well, the other three things. How do I use my time? Don't go any further. This is the question I'm asking. How do you use your time? So you've got how many hours a week? You don't know how many hours a week you've got? You know the calculation though, don't you? Okay, 24 by 7. What's that? 168, is it? 4, 7, 28. 7, 4, 68. Okay. And how many, how many hours do you sleep? Around eight a day. So, so we've got 168. And let's say we sleep eight times seven. What's that? 56. So we got 56 off of that. What's that? All right. So we've got 112 available waking hours. Right? How many hours do you spend like caring what I would call your bodily functions and needs? Let's, let's have a look at that calculation. Bodily functions and needs. You've got to sit on the loo occasionally, usually once a day or maybe twice if you're going really regular. You've got to go to the toilet to, do, to, to get rid of the urine that your body processes to get rid of a lot of your waste. So if you added all that up in a day, how much would that be? Half an hour? Let's be generous. Make it a half an hour. If you're my father, you might sit on the loo for an hour and read a book while you're there, but that's probably not doing the job. So half an hour. Okay, how many meals do we have a day? Most of us two or three. So how many hours would you spend having the meal? <laughs> right, most of you spend 15 minutes eating the meal, let's face it. So let's say it's half an hour per meal, and there's three of them, so there's one and a half hours. How many hours would you spend preparing the meal? This is assuming you're a self-responsible being and you do all of your own preparation. How many hours would you do that? Let's say it's the same amount or maybe a bit more, shall we? 
So let's allow a couple of hours there. So let's two hours there. Um, how? What other things you got to do? You got to get dressed. You've got to wash your clothes occasionally. Otherwise, everyone around you thinks that, uh, that that you're unpleasant to be with. How many hours a day would that be? About an hour. Would that be about an hour? You think? I think. Let's be generous and make it two, shall we? Okay. This is per per day. So what's that? Six times by seven is 42. So we take 42 off of our total. What are we left with? 70. 70 hours of usable time every week. 70 hours. So the question I'm asking you, you now is how do you spend that 70 hours? Well, we spend a bit of time working. So work? Yeah. Okay. How many hours? Oh, for me at the moment it's 23, but... So if you're casual, it might be 20, yeah. 30. Yeah. If you're full-time, it might be 40 or even 50, right? So it could be anywhere up to 50 hours. So should we say... Let's, let's put it in a range. 20 to 50, let's say. Now, if, we, if it's 50... Can you see 50? Now we've only got 20 hours left. That's pretty harsh, eh? Yep. yep. Okay. If it's 20, then we've got a bit more time left, haven't we? Okay. Yep. What else do we do with our time? What do you do with your time? Be honest. What do you do? Thanks, Christiana. If we have the mic there. Fill it with addictions. Fill it with addictions, okay, yep. Uh, can we be a bit more specific about what those addictions are? Facebook. Sorry? Facebook. Facebook, okay. How many people spend a few hours on Facebook every day? Or an hour on Facebook every day? Let's say an hour on Facebook every day. So let's say it's one hour times by seven. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Seven hours. And remember now we're getting down in our time and we're spending quite a lot of our time on Facebook. You know. Why do we have Facebook? Because we love a facade. That's why we have it. And we also love the addiction of everybody being interested in our life. Right? Well, don't you have your own page? Isn't it your page? And isn't it your feed? And isn't it what you're interested in, what you do? Why do you have to advertise what you do to the rest of the world? Because you want the rest of the world to be interested in what you do. Isn't that narcissistic? Of course it is. So we've got to be honest about it. Let's be honest about it. We do it because we want people to be interested in us. There's an, there's an addiction, but there's one of the addictions. So there's seven hours there. What other addictions we might have? Thanks, Karen. I think, and I think that's an addiction. <laughs> yeah. you, th you think. So you spend time just what? So much time. Worrying. Would that be a better way of putting it? Um, mixture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How many of you spend a lot of time worrying? Yep. So there's a fair few of you there. So let's see. You worry. What else do we do? Teresa? Television. Television? TV? Yeah. TVs, videos, listening to music. What, what, how many hours? You know, for everyone it's a bit different, isn't it? But how many of you don't watch any telly the entire week? At all? Okay, a few. How many of you watch a movie a week? At least a movie a week. Or two movies a week? Or three movies a week? Four movies a week? <laughs> Five movies a week? <laughs> right. If we were talking to a group of ch kids, what would we be also asking about? Games, video games, like, things like that, all time. Now, can you see, this is where we're spending our time. Now, can I contrast that for you? How much time do you spend actually giving yourself time to do what I feel is the most important thing you could ever do for your relationship with God, which is prayer? Let's be honest. What's our time? 
How many of us even spend any time in a week doing it? A few of us? Yeah. All right, let's say how many of you spend all your time in prayer but it's all because you want addictions from God to be met? That's, that's partially the case, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. But can you see even just the amount of time we're using for, the, for our life? And remember, we've only got about 70 hours of it left from the week. Right, so this is our magic number. This is the number that we is our measuring stick, if you like. In terms of percentage of this time on the most important thing you could ever do, which is pray, it's not very high percentage, is it? If we're honest with ourselves, right? How much time do we spend loving others in that in that way? When I say loving others, I mean actually doing something for somebody, not because you're going to get something back from them, not because you're going to get an addiction met doing it, and not because you're going to feel good afterwards, but because you want to. How much time do we spend? In real terms. Often not very long, right? How much time in comparison do we actually spend arguing with the person that we say we love? <laughs> Or having a fight with the person we say we love, or disagreeing with the person we say we love, or all those kind of things, quite often quite a lot, right? Okay. Now, I've only looked at two areas here, and we could make a long list, couldn't we? Let's make some lists, shall we? If we just have a look. So we, we've gone working, entertainment, keep going, working towards my hobbies, responding to my crises in my life, getting addictions met in my relationships with others, spending time with people with common interests, doing things for myself, getting my addictions met with my activities and food and drink, and suppressing and resisting my real emotions. How much time do I spend doing all that? Most of our time, right, of those 70 hours. Trying to have fun to mask how I really feel. How about that one? A lot of time. Now, let's, do we spend our time like this? Let's have a look. Praying. Reflecting on God's truth, reflecting upon my life, improving my understanding and practice of God's laws, feeling and experiencing my true emotions. Can you, can you see the list? All right. Improving my relationship with my partner, improving my relationship with myself, improving my relationship with my children, improving my relationship with my friends, working on becoming a more loving individual towards others. How much time do I spend doing that? Now, where you spend your time is where your will is. That's the reality. So if you spend most of your time doing the first list and none of your time doing the next list, you can't then claim that you're doing everything possible for your relationship with God or your relationship with your partner or growing in love. Like It's, it's just not even truthful to claim it. Do you see that? So this is like a measure. How do I use my time? It's a measure of everything. How I use my time is a bit of a problem at the moment. I've got five more minutes. Okay, how do I use my will? Now, will is a lot about emotion, right? So it's not about your force of will. It's not about your willpower, as Mary will talk about. It's about your emotion. So how are you using your emotion? Now, let's go through this. How am I using my will? What do I use it for? Do I use it so that I get my addictions met? Do I use it for enjoying meeting the addictions of other people? You know the feeling you get when you meet the addiction of another person? Goes, ah, isn't that wonderful? How many times do we feel that? Getting angry when others don't meet my addictions. Getting passive-aggressive with other people when they don't meet my addictions. Suppressing and resisting my real emotions. Doing things for myself. Doing things to please others. Doing things for others in order to get something in return. That's called work, by the way. For many of you, work fits into that category. Doing things and for others in order to get something in return. 
See, many of us, of that 70 hours, we spend 40 doing things for someone else in order to get something in return. Have you thought about it that way? What are we looking for in return? Money. Why do we want that? Because we don't believe we're going to get money if we do the things we really want. If we do things God's way, if we do engage things God's way, we don't believe in that. And we see the world doesn't work that way and we can't work that way. And so we believe that we have to barter 40 hours of our time in order to get what we need. So work fits into that category. Blaming God for my problems. Blaming others for my problems. Still, still, going on, going on. Keep going, keep going, because there's more. Expecting, demanding things from others. Keep going, keep going. Let's, let's list them all. <laughs> Have a look at those, that list. Want someone else to change before you do. Walking away when you're confronted emotionally. Denying your real feelings. Justifying your unloving feelings, words and actions. Minimising them. Blaming others for your unloving feelings, words and actions. Enjoying staying in your comfort zone. Control and manipulate others or your environment. How much time do you spend... Your will doing, how is your will engaged emotionally in all of these things? If we analyse it, we go, after doing all of that list, we go, it's amazing I've got any time for God. I'm, it's pretty amazing even if I've got one hour left after that for God, right? Or for my desire to grow in love. Or do we act the opposite way with the way that we use our will? So let's list some of those. Now, the outline I've prepared will list them all for you. So I don't want to labour on them here. What I'm doing is showing you the technique of how you can measure your own desire for change. So we've done two things so far. It's the use of our time. It's the use of our will. And what was the third one? Living in truth. Let's go, let's go to that. So let's go through these. This is how we've used our will. We can use our will positively in all of these directions, right? But most of us don't, unfortunately. And keep going, because there's more. <laughs> there's so many things. And the outline that I've prepared, you can, list them, you can watch them all and list them all, all off for yourself. So do, let's look at the do I live in truth issue. Truth. How am I going to live in truth? What do I do when I... What demonstrates whether I'm living in truth or not? Well, let's look, look at what demonstrates that we're not living in truth. What do we do? Let's have a look. I rarely tell the truth, especially when it's hard and when I may be punished or someone else is going to get angry. Now, couldn't most of us fit into that category? All right? Okay. We tell the truth only when we're pressured. So if someone puts a bit of pressure on and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. We withhold the truth about past unloving behaviour. So, you, you know, you're entering a new relationship and the very first thing you do is tell them all the bad things you've done in your life. And if they're still with you at the end of that, they're a pretty good person, right? But most of us don't do that. What do we do instead? We tell them all the good things we've done in our life. And, and if we haven't got many, we make some up. <laughs> yeah. Withhold the truth when, I, when my personal finances are involved with legal or taxation issues. Mm. So do I tell the truth to the, to, the, to the ATO? Do I tell the truth in a legal battle? Do I tell the truth when somebody sued me? Do I tell the truth when I'm under pressure, when I got picked up driving? You know, the police come up and say, what speed were you doing? You go, yeah, if I say it was 170, maybe if I say it was 150, that would be better. And he says, no, mate, it was 170. I'm sure it was 150. I had my cruise control set up. Do we argue with the truth? This is where one, most of us have a lot of trouble. Someone presents the truth, and what do we do? We go, oh, I don't think it's like that. No, it's not like that. No, I don't see that. I don't see that. Um, and, and in fact, we even get firmer, don't we? We go, no, you're wrong. You're definitely wrong. It's this and it's that and it's this and it's that. We come up with 150 different things than what it really was. You're going to find that in your personal truth sessions. Yep. We get angry about the truth. Someone tells us the truth and what we do? Get all annoyed, angry, resentful, don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. Yep. 
We attack others when they tell us the truth. We go, that person just told me the truth. I didn't like it. So what do we do? Oh, I know five things about them that can really hurt them. That's what I'll say. So off we go. Yeah, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. And this happens a lot in a fight, doesn't it? Like you, particularly a partner-based fight. You get, you get people saying all of these things because somebody just told you the truth. Do you justify your current feelings, emotions, and belief systems out of harmony with love? Do you, do you say, oh, yeah, and this, honestly, I've just heard this over and over again. Oh, yeah. I do do that, but I have made a lot of changes. Yeah, that's the justification, isn't it? Like, you're saying that because you've made a lot of other changes, it's okay for you to do what you just did that was out of harmony with love. Do you think God thinks that? That you've made 25 changes here, so this really big change over here that you need to make, you haven't made, and God's going, God's going yeah, oh, oh, you've made those 25 little changes. Oh, I'll get you off the hook with this big one. <laughs> Do you think that's how God works with you? Definitely not. They're like, there's a line in the sand with God. Like, you can't step over it. Yeah. Ignore feedback of God's laws that God's laws and others give us. Now, if most of us are honest, these are the kind of things we do with regard to truth. That's an indication that in our heart, the desire for truth hasn't changed. Right. Okay, let's have a look. Oh. Do we always tell the truth no matter what, no matter how much trouble it's going to get us in, and no matter how bad it's going to get, we just keep telling the truth? Do we do that? Do we do that in our relationships, with our friends, with our family, with our children, with, our, like, with everyone? Do you do that with the taxation office with the, with a legal, in a legal battle? Do you do it, you know, did you do it at school? Did you do it at work? Did you do it wherever you are? Right? Do you desire to volunteer and tell the truth in every circumstance or do you wait until it's sucked out of you through a process? <laughs> you know what I mean by you get sucked out of you, don't you? Like, you know, you go, you just sit there and somebody's asking a question, you go, oh, yeah, mm. and oh, yeah, mm. and oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Off we go, we just keep on going. This, this constant, we're trying to constantly not say anything so we don't get ourselves in trouble. Right? Rather than just blurt out exactly what the issue is. And most of the time we know what they're asking. You know, it's like a, it's like a little teenage child coming home to mummy and daddy and she's been out past the curfew of 11pm and they say, where were you? Oh, just places. <laughs> where were you? Oh, I was just with my friends. Where were you? Oh, we were down, uh, you know, down near the main street. Where were you? Ah, oh, yeah, we just happened to walk into a, a place, you know, where you dance. Where were you? Ah, oh, we're at the pub. <laughs> you know, like you get to the point eventually, right? The thing that they they didn't want to say, and we, we have to it has to be sucked out of them. For most of us, that's what we're like. The truth, isn't it? It has to be just pulled out of us by somebody who's persistent enough to put up with our resistance. Yeah. Do we make opportunities to disclose the truth? So, you know, I've heard this very frequently where people go, I didn't have an opportunity to tell them what actually happened. And I go, well, so do, do they have hearing? Yes. Do you have words? Yes. And you never had an opportunity? No. Didn't you create one? What do you mean create one? There wasn't an opportunity. No, there is opportunities. You create them. That's what you do. So if you say that you've never had an opportunity to tell the truth under certain circumstances... So, for example, here's a good example. A man's cheated on his wife. He's never had the opportunity to tell her. Now, what's a valid opportunity under those circumstances? <laughs> Every single moment he's with her is a valid opportunity, I would have thought. But what does he think? He's got to know, he's got to know that 
He's not going to get in trouble. He's got to know that she's not going to leave him. He's got to know that everything's going to be fine and she forgives him. And she's, he's got to know all those things. And none of those things are true, probably. And so when, when's the valid opportunity in his mind? Never. Never. Yeah. Let's have a look. I openly disclose the truth with regard to my income, expenses and legal requirements. None of you do that yet. I do it. You can have a look at my income and expenses on the internet. None of you do it. I've never seen a place where any of you have put your income and expenses every year on, an inter on the internet or in a public place where anybody can see it. Why? Because you want, you, your feeling is, that's my business. Every spirit knows exactly what you do. God knows exactly what you do. And if you're embarrassed about what you do, there's a problem, isn't there? Like, obviously, I'd change something. Why don't you do it? Do you know one thing that often I, I reflect upon is that many of you say, you know, look at the person who's teaching you divine truth, and you say, how? and you don't ask yourself the question, how is he living his life? What has he already demonstrated to me through his actions? What I should be doing with my life? Now, I've been putting my income expenses on the internet for the last three or four years. Anybody can see it. Why don't you do it? Susan? Can we ask for no? I don't honestly feel anybody would be interested. I don't agree with you. you. That's not the reason why you don't do it. That's the excuse you give. How many people, how many of you feel, what's he talking about here? Why does he want us to do that? Yeah, you feel that? Yeah. That's your resistance to truth. That's your resistance to transparency. See, a person who wants to be truthful is transparently open all the time and they want to be like that. Do you get that? They want to be like that. You know why most of us don't do that? Because we like to know we've got a little bit in a kitty in reserve and nobody needs to know about that and sometimes it's not even the tax man knows about that and you know we have all these things going on in our life with regard to money. We have a lot of problems with regard to money from an addiction perspective. We have a lot of problems with regard to money about being truthful with it. We have a lot of problems about how we spend it. We have a lot of problems with judgment. In other words, we're worried about how other people will judge how we use our money and our time and everything, so we don't disclose it. That's all avoidance of emotion, isn't it? And a person who's humble passionately desires to experience every emotion. So wouldn't a great opportunity be openly disclose everything and see where the chips fall? Openly disclose it with the tax man first, if you haven't already done that, and then openly disclose it with... Everyone, the world in general. If, you imagine if everybody did that. Imagine if every company did that. And every person on earth did that. It would be able to then remedy a lot of lot, what I would call imbalances in the world. Right? Because quite often there's two people, one's black, one's white, and the white person is in the same job as the black person, and the black person is getting paid less. That happens in the States, it happens in other places, it also happens here, by the way. Right? And they say it's because, no, there's equality. No, there's not. It's demonstrable by the fact that the actual payment is different. But we don't want to face the truth of that as a society, and so we tell ourselves that everything's fine, it's all legislated, and it's all okay. That's what we do. But if we openly disclosed everything, we wouldn't be able to do any of those things anymore. Right? If the average business openly disclosed how much it always puts under the counter, then the government would know straight away how much of a black economy there is, or a grey economy there is. And the government would be able to make assessments on that, for our own benefit actually. But we don't do that because we like to have this and we don't want to pay tax on that and we don't want to disclose this. It's a problem, right? A problem is truth. That's our problem. 
Now, to really refine the issue of truth, you, there's a lot of areas in our lives that have got to change, if you think about it. Yeah. Openly disclose the truth, even when it appears to not be in my best interest to do so. So someone comes to me and says, do you believe you're Jesus? I say, yes. Now, Mary used to go to me, why do you say that? You know that they're just going to attack you after that. I know it's not in my best interest to do that from their perspective. But from God's perspective, I know it's in my best interest. Always tell the truth. Do you see the difference? Just because the world thinks it's not in your best interest, it doesn't mean that God thinks the same. Yep. So can you see, we can start, we can list many things here. We just Do we easily accept the truth? Do we easily accept the law of attraction? Do we always allow things? What, what are we doing? What are we doing with these three things? So what I'm hoping you've taken away from my chat today with you, which went 10 minutes over time, sorry about that, is that you need to assess how you use your time. You need to assess how you use your will and you need to assess how much you are living in truth in your day-to-day -day life and you need to do that to use a personal measurement of whether you really have a desire for personal change. Now if after analysing all of that you come up with this thing, this one thing, actually if I'm honest with myself, I don't really have a desire for personal change. So if that's the assessment, then you need to hear Corny's talk, which is next. Because he's going to address why it is that you have a resistance and not a strong desire for personal change. Does that make sense? And this is where we, what we're trying to do this week is start you off at a place where you can personally assess through some things that don't, that are not um, what I would call personal opinion anymore. They are actual things that are either true or not true, that you can assess whether you really desire to grow and change or not. And that's what we would like you to do. So your homework for my talk is, have a look at those three areas of your life and assess Honestly, for yourself, whether you have a very strong desire for personal change. That's right. So do that today sometime. Do that tonight. I don't think we've got any program on tonight. So you'll have a chance to do this tonight. Assess to see whether you very have a very strong desire for personal change. Now, if the answer is no, or my desire is out of 100%, my desire is 10%, or my desire is 5%, or my desire is 20%, let's say, then you need to know why. And so what, what Cornelius is going to do is discuss with you why. What's really going on that causes you to not have a passionate desire that's there 100% of the time of your life? for change. Does that sound alright? Yeah? Okay. Now, can I just make one more statement before Corny comes up? Don't judge yourself about it. Accurate assessments are not possible when you judge. See, when you've got all this emotional stuff going on, we go, oh, that's really bad, so I'm going to sort of deny that that's happening. That is not an accurate assessment anymore. You need to allow yourself to not judge these things. Don't judge them and don't justify them. Just state what they are. Do you, do you get that? Don't justify them, don't minimise them, don't shift the blame onto somebody else, don't say it's all impossible, don't say God's to blame for it all. Just allow yourself to assess without judgement. So if you can do that for us, that will help you with the next step that Corny is going to introduce you to 
which is the, the introduction of what do I do now that my personal assessment has shown me that I have very little desire for change? What are the reasons for this lack of desire? Huh? Lily? Um, you know, you had the list on the um, screen about how you use your will in the right direction or the wrong direction. Yes. Do you have printouts of those yet? We have printouts of everything. Hurrah. All right. And what we'll be doing at the conclusion of the assistance group is we'll be putting them all up on the net. But I haven't got a printout to give you now. That's the only thing. So this is why you need to think for yourself. Rather than going through AJ's checklist, you need to make one of your own. Do you follow me? So there will be one up where you'll be able to reflect upon the, the list that I've given you, but it'll, it'll come later. The same applies for all of our talks that we'll be giving you. OK, so let me just rub this off the board and get myself ready. You all will need to have a break now and go to the toilet. Don't do too much of a rush, otherwise you... <laughs> and we'll have a 10-minute break. Just give us 10 minutes and we'll be back.